um, David Navarro, who's um, one of the key advisors on COVID to the World Health Organization. And, and I used this term post-COVID world and he corrected me. He said, no, we need to create a COVID ready world. This isn't going away. So I think in terms of context for the question, it's really important that we recognize that we're not going back to an old way of life. There's a new reality and it's that new reality that needs to frame the question, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that's actually a really important linguistic distinction here as well, because I think the spirit of what we sort of mean by it is we need to really address the fact that the world is ever, ever unpredictable and we've got to do whatever we can to be ready for it. So I think that's a really useful distinction. Thanks, Ross. Can I jump in? Sorry. And I've forgotten to use my hands because I lost it for a moment. But just a... a I think that's a, such a good point. It's about dealing with the world as it is and as it's going to be. And I was just reflecting on if we were to use this post-coronavirus, it doesn't really matter whether we use that or not. But I see one of the critical things as being, um, are we in a world where we do things together or are we in a world where things are done to us? Uh, and are we being made to do things against our will? or being engaged in uh, the agency of developing solutions and working on those solutions together. So I think uh, it's perhaps this awful experience has shone a light on the importance of that. And I wonder, I don't want to kind of misuse it, that experience, but that's the direction I think a lot of work on things like learner voice, a lot of work that a number of different people have been using have been trying to push in that direction and maybe in this uh, adopting and embracing corona world rather than going to the post-corona world that gives us a, a, a shot in the arm to use an important sort of thought at the moment <laughs> to to take that forward and do it better yeah thanks very much gavin could we have uh, ian then back to ross Thank you. Just to pick up on Gavin's point, I think there's almost a kind of bigger question, a kind of meta question around um, using this as an opportunity for a reset. You know, I think we're all interested in the enormous potential that certain kinds of education can have. But we also know that over the last few years, we've all been struggling to get people to prioritize that and take it seriously. We know that so many systems around the world kind of go, yeah, yeah, social emotional learning, whole child stuff, yeah, all of that is great. But what about maths? <laughs> this is an opportunity for a reset because it is. But I'm really worried because, um, sort of to start with, I kind of saw this and thought, this is brilliant. This is an opportunity. Looking at, say, the DFE going, oh no, we don't need to bother with public exams this year. I thought that was fantastic. A really great kind of open door to change and new thinking. But equally, when you look at what actually an awful lot of governments are doing and how they're addressing the issue, it, it is for them very much a return, a struggle to get back to business as usual, to exams, to STEM, to process, process, process. Um, we're working with um, the government and the Northern Territory, among others, in Australia. And I was fascinated to see that the three things they prioritised for all students were well-being, maths and literacy. Well-being first. And that's probably the only government that I've come across who've kind of put that at the top and said, look, this is the thing we've got to get right. Everything else is, is secondary. And I think that kind of, this is a really exciting conversation to be having, but I think it's a conversation we need to be having quite quickly because I think the opportunities to push that reset button are going to recede very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this question of reset and like what we actually mean by that might be a useful one to pick up a bit later on. Um, but let's go to Ross, then Rachel, then Tom. I'll hand straight over to Rachel. I think I was my comment was along the lines of Ian, so I'll pass. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was just going to pick up on it, really, what Ian was saying. Working in schools, I think you're absolutely right. It does give us the opportunity to reset and think about how, how our curriculum um, is meeting the needs of the young pupils that we serve. Um, and I think that schools are 
quite forward thinking in that. Certainly in the group of schools that I work with, we've looked at the recovery curriculum and the principles that underpin that um, by Barry Carpenter, who's obviously done lots of research. And I think that there's been a flood on the internet of um, opportunities for schools to have free access to resources, rich resources. Um, I think many organizations have stepped up and allowed schools to access those provisions and those resources that would have been quite costly to them. Um, and schools are sort of filtering those out of what is what are quality resources that can support the pupils um, in their care what what my, my concern is that yes we've got to do that in in terms of welcoming our um, pupils back on june the first which some of us are doing but also to balance that with with staff well-being as well and actually what mechanisms have we got to support staff well-being while serving um, our community as a whole Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Tom. Great, thank you. I mean, you know, as as was mentioned at the beginning, obviously, social emotional learning is a huge uh, a huge spectrum of lots of different things going on, right? So, just as context for 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 the work we do at Skills Builder, it's all about building um, a set of essential skills, um, so things like communication skills, interpersonal skills, uh, self management, and creative problem solving. So that's the sort of uh, not that I think that's all that social emotional learning is, but that's sort of the, the particular angle, I guess, uh, that by thinking about it. And I think one interesting point is that we've been having a lot of conversations recently with employers. Um, and uh, an employer's view is that they are uh, incredibly panicked um, about uh, what's going to happen next for their organisations. Um, and, you know, and some of them, you know, some of our partners uh, include major airports, for example, who are, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's a, the whole business model turned right on its head immediately, right? Um, but I think what's really interesting is that I think if we're talking about how do you get social and emotional learning to be more widely uh, appreciated and respected, I think actually employers are going to be a really uh, important ally on that because uh, employers, every employer I talk to at the moment is talking about how they need um, people who are going to be able to adapt and to change. They know that they're going to have to do a lot of change within their own. Um, what they really want to look for is some of those wider um, social and emotional competences, um, because actually they feel like uh, they can build technical skills that they need quickly. Um, but what they really need is people who are going to be open and, and ready to adapt and to change and to um, cope with a great deal of uncertainty. So just thought I'd, um, I'd throw that into the mix. Yes, yeah, super helpful. Thanks, Tom. And could we have Eileen? Please correct my pronunciation of your name as well. Huge apologies. That's okay. Good morning. My name it's Eileen, and it's a, but anything slightly similar is fine. <laughs> it's an unusual name. Um, I really appreciate the comments or contributions um, so far, and just want to to build on those a little bit um, in terms of not uh, a COVID ready world, also a continuing world with the pandemic COVID as well as um, whatever a new normal is after that. Because in a sense, um, the, the pandemic is continuing, it's ongoing. Um, I'm coming from a public mental health promotion sort of framework. With, and most of, of what I'm hearing is that we're in the early stages. Um, Um, SEL means different things to different people, looks differently, etc. But, but from a general viewpoint and incorporating the, the reset idea and the learner's voice idea and also teachers is something about supporting learners, teachers, schools, families, communities to make sense of their experience, what they're experiencing now in COVID. In other words, not um, saying, okay, that's COVID, that's outside. 
of your experience. Now you're in school and we have certain skills we're going to learn. But starting with their lived experiences for the learners, the teachers, the families, the communities, um, an eco-social approach to, uh, to uh, enable the learners and the whole community to make sense of what they've just been through, which again touches on the earlier point that was made. Are we in a world where things are done to us? Are we in a world where we have agency? Can we collaborate? But providing a framework uh, through social and emotional learning that helps people to make sense of it and to prepare for um, this new normal. So, and focus a strength-based, developmental, age-appropriate, ecological approach that is also a whole person approach that understands um, the, 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 the problems that people have experienced as well as the resources that they already have to help them address those problems and really builds on the well-being and the resilience um, because we know that as the well-being and resilience are increased, that will mitigate any psychosocial impairment or, may, or mental health conditions that, that, that may be developing through this. Um, and, and just seeing a lot of different ways, there, the, the incorporation of apps and e-resources, e but somehow doing that without creating another inequality of those who have access and those who don't. So um, anyway, I'm blurring some of the, because that's probably more of a challenge, but, but this role of helping people to make sense and to, have, um, to understand the meaning of what they have experienced. And that has been what has brought them to where they are now, and that will prepare them of where the, for where they're going to go. So that's kind of a general thought that I think fits with the very you know, huge variety of SEL frameworks. So yeah, enormously interesting things there. Lots of things that we could pick up from that. Um, can I ask um, Emily, then Matthew, and then maybe if we pause just to do a quick recap of where we've got to so far, and where we might want to go next. Yeah, I was just going to sort of say similarly to Eileen, just this idea that actually what to me seems to be coming out really clearly is this idea of resilience. I think actually the COVID period that we've all been living through is actually just really a catalyst that I think this idea of resilience and well-being is something that as a community, as a society, we've been touching on um, previous to this. We just haven't had quite this platform, this opportunity to delve into it in quite so much detail. It's always been, I think, considered something of a nice to have, whereas actually it's it's been shoved to the forefront that it's an essential. It really is critical to one's health in like in its entirety. So I think, um, so kind of coming, circling back to the beginning of the conversation, this idea of a post COVID world, actually, I think that COVID coronavirus, this lockdown is just one aspect that ought to be thought of considered because we encounter difficulties and challenges throughout our lives, whether it's on a, pandemic scale or just in our family lives and our in our growth and development in general and I think maybe that kind of looking at a, a longer term context an approach that would encapsulate and support and allow the individual to grow more broadly both as an individual but as Eileen said within the context of a family um, family network society network, but also within that school ecosystem where the teachers also have that well-being um, at the forefront of their of their day-to-day -day as well would be really, really key. Mm -hmm. Super. Thanks, Emily. Matthew? Yeah, thanks. Um, really enjoying the conversation. Uh, John, just to pick up on the, the how you started, which is I think you're right to resist um, a, a squabble about the definition of SEL. Um, but I think that um, it's important to think about the question of SEL for what, though. I, I think that, that um, and, you know, it has many, there's many different goals you might want to achieve um, through developing SEL, and, and, and it does make a big difference to think about, um, to think about the goals. I, I think most about SEL as a, as a um, the goal of developing SEL to promote learning um, in classrooms, and, and I work in um, low-income countries, mainly in Africa. Um, 
one of the concepts that I, the last, the last bit of research I did last year in, in Tanzania talks a lot about is um, how important the sense of togetherness is in classrooms. And, and I think more so than, um, I mean, I, I don't have data to prove this, but more so than in, in our country, for example. And for example, teachers don't like even even splitting kids up into groups because they 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 erode this sense of of we're a classroom together and we're connected to each other and just to think about togetherness as a resource you know that we need to stick together um but also as a um as something that can potentially be undermined i mean you know remote learning being the most obvious example of how a sense of togetherness is is eroded so i think that's an important concept um and I just wanted to add one other thought, which is which is not really my area of research, but just in terms of a COVID ready world and, and pre, pre, um, preparing for that, I just think about how many decisions we're called on to make um, that require a high degree of critical thinking to, to think about the messages that we're receiving, the data we're receiving and, and the motivations behind what we're receiving. Um, and also ethics, you know, the ethical decisions about, uh, about your responsibility to um, the rest of society versus your own, you know, individual mental health, for example. Uh, these are all complex decisions, and 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 I know that some branches of of SCL are are, are concerned with preparing people to make these kinds of decisions. Yeah, I think that's an enormously interesting point about this cell for what and who is defining that as well. Um, very, very interesting. Um, Ross, has your hand up been from before, or is this a new one? Uh, sorry, I can't actually see that my hand is up, so I'm assuming it's, it's from before. Apologies. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, I, there's a little button that says lower hand if you're happy to. Could, no, um, no, no, no ways at all. Um, can we have uh, Susan and Gavin? Okay, good morning everyone. Um, coming from a perspective of having worked as a CEO over a group of schools in the UK and also um, my more recent experiences both in uh, places like Uganda and Kenya um, through school A and associations with, uh, with STIR and also experience from uh, some of the schools in, um, in Australia and New Zealand. I, just on a, a general point, I do find in comparison, the UK is doing an awful lot in terms of social and emotional learning and, uh, and intelligence and developing, the, and in de developing that side of things. Um, I know from a long time ago, a lot of the programmes, Learning to Learn, for instance, did deal with issues um, and how best to promote resilience, reflectiveness, and their learning styles were in the classroom were readily adapted to in order to develop resilience. And that concept of working together, collaboration, and uh, the sense of togetherness. I think from my experience, um, it, working with schools in, uh, in Kenya and in Uganda, it's the few rather than the many that are developing those softer skills um, because of the high stakes with regarding examination pressures i think a lot of the schools that i have witnessed have been less focused on the emotional intelligence side of uh, of working with students um, i know that scholae have certainly worked with the schools there in very much developing the um, social and emotional side of, of their curriculum, character building, employability and things like that. So um, it's really following on from what people have said regarding the resilience and the togetherness. There are programmes out there that, already, that will do that and build on it, but it's how we get that consistency across more and more schools so that they can uh, develop those skills. And uh, I believe that that's where we have to focus our energies on now. Okay. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, Gavin? Oh, yeah. The, Gavin, then sorry. Ross. Yeah, uh, great 
lovely points from from everybody thank you i'm just picking up on a couple of things that it's sprung, it's caused me to think about um matthew's talk about definition i think really important not to get caught up in that discussion and i always think that we lose sight of the fact that every child in a class of let's say 30 or 50 or 100 uh, comes away from any lesson with a different version of it from everybody else so you know let let's kind of take that on board and allow everybody to have the version which is contextualized for themselves by themselves with all the other inputs that they have uh, so trying to get that across in some way is important i think also we've touched on how we uh, carry things forward and how we make the arguments i think to get things on board i think one of the big arguments is it's for everybody in the school so teachers yes uh, support staff yes leaders of school yes so it's uh, not one of these things being done to one group within the school it is actually for everybody and what we need is evidence of that kind of thing and i suggest that we do have some evidence some of that evidence is uh, the you know this is uh, uh, forgive me for jumping into one example but one example is the uh, the happiness curriculum which i'm sure many of you've heard of going on led by Manish Sisodia as the Minister of Education for Delhi and all the schools in Delhi. And the happiness curriculum is something that happens uh, at the beginning of each day. To me, forget all the detail. One of the most important points in that is every child in each of those schools is voices heard at the beginning of every day. So they speak and they have an opportunity to uh, present where they are and what they're about and I think it's that kind of granularity that is really important to giving agency to making people people feel they're part of the solutions rather than part of the problems of with things being done to them and I just think a, a couple of other things if I may I think that if we're going to argue this I, I always wonder about the you know the OECD says that we're supposed to have a view on knowledge skills attitudes and values if we're going to uh, have uh, education systems that work uh, but all, most of ours put knowledge and skills as kind of the, the top level it's the attitudes and values that give us the foundations i think of believing that social and emotional learning is important and me even believing that everybody has a contribution to make to that and so i uh, would love actually if one of the consequences of this sort of discussion is that we start with values and uh, attitudes so get the behaviors of which we can build and as has been said by others I, I think when you get those things right then you get improvement in your education systems and just one last thing on, on Manish Sadia in, in, in Delhi the latest that I've heard from the reports back from the people working on that there what they have noticed is that there is improvement of the relationship between teachers and pupils improvements of the relationships between teachers and parents and uh, improved results are coming are coming out there isn't actually that's not research done but that's the feeling they have that is coming out from that uh, that initiative thanks Ross. gavin uh, very interesting uh, perspectives and it just I think what's coming to me is this uh, slight tension, I think, on a number of fronts, one of which is um, certainly my own inclination to say, OK, what are these specific values and attitudes that we need to develop? You know, get into real granular detail. And I've spent years doing that. It drives me mad and you never end up with any sort of uh, any uh, agreement on what those things should be. So I've, on the one hand, I feel a, t a tension between the value in going, becoming precise and, um, uh, you know, almost measuring those things at a very granular level versus the argument that we should be developing the whole human being, which is a much more kind of general, um, self-directed idea, I think. Um, and I feel that, I feel that tension a little bit. The other tension I feel is the tension in this conversation which is you know the the dfe there's good signs from the dfe then they're starting to shut us down and it's this sense that um the tension between us wanting 
the system to change, the system to allow us to do this work versus the idea that perhaps there are hundreds and thousands of us already doing this around the world. And my sense is that maybe we're not paying enough attention to the people who are just getting on and doing it and celebrating that and creating an, an, a movement or a wave of energy of people who are just getting on and doing it. Instead of fighting the existing system, I wonder if we might invite a, a movement in a, more, uh, in, in a more careful way. John, can, can I just come back very quickly on yes. one of those? Yeah, just, just the, uh, certainly my intention is not to uh, start going down the route of <laughs> tying things down. But what I do think is important, in, in the case of what is happening in Delhi, uh, and in other cases and other things happening elsewhere. Uh, if you ask the ch children in a class, what would you like your reputation to be? You know this, we've discussed it. <laughs> but but it's not about actually fixing it. It's actually about giving people agency in making that decision. And when you, co uh, when you have a conversation, so the children in a group or the adults in a group or the people in a, in a profession start discussing what these things should be and agree it, then you come to a different set of solutions. So that is something which is, it's harder because it takes more time, but it's absolutely to my initial point, I think, of uh, it, things being done by people and agency being given to people rather than from taking it away by putting it in a, a list of things that you've got to remember. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, I see a couple of people have got their hands up. Could I just pause for a second here just to sort of summarise where I think we are so far? We're about sort of 30 minutes in here. And what I'd actually love to do is sort of um, building on sort of what Ross and Gavin were saying there. Is I'd love to actually start hearing people's experience of addressing some of these things and sort of what like challenges and advice um, they, they have. Um, it sort of feels like like a big theme coming through here is like one of of opportunity um, and from what I've been hearing here I guess there's like three sort of buckets that are, that are coming out number one is like around the what like what are we actually talking about in terms of the opportunity here Ian mentioned about this chance for like a, a reset at sort of the highest levels of an education system for them to reassess and reevaluate their goals um, Gavin and others have talked about the importance of using this opportunity to instill and build a sense of agency in stakeholders in the system. Um, um, the second bucket, I guess, is this question of how, how we actually go about doing that. Rachel talked a bit about access and how we actually allow and enable schools to get that. Um, Eileen talked about um, the importance of developing frameworks um, and then Gavin also talked about the importance of like actually defining and the behaviours and skills that we that we want to develop as well. And then um, I think there was a question of the who as well as the third bucket around how do we engage other key stakeholders in this. Tom talked about how do we engage the role of employers. Eileen talked about how we engage like wider ecosystems that are involved in this as well. I wonder just in terms of taking it forward, whether we could um, address the conversation looking at those three things and just invite people who have got experience in each one just to share like, this is what we've been thinking about to try to actually achieve those things. Here's some of the challenges we've been facing. and This is some of the learning that we have. And um, would that work as a way to sort of take the conversation forward? And please do correct me if I've misrepresented any of the discussion so far in that, in that summary. Uh, John, could we hear from you first? Sure, yeah, um, contributions so far have been um, excellent and don't really have much to add on um, other than just an observation really about the role of parents in this and the context I think links back to your point John in terms of what we're trying to do about this. Uh, my social enterprise has been working in schools now for over 15 years, deploying health mentors to focus on the holistic development of children, so physically, emotionally and cognitively. And sometimes they're on the periphery of schools and very rarely do um, they get air time with the head teacher or the um, principal. 
But what's happened in the last um, six to eight weeks is something that we've not experienced in the last 15 years, where they're now the, the, the superhero within that school. And the irony is they're not physically present in the school with children. They're doing most of their mentoring work, focusing on the social and emotional aspects, but they're doing it virtually. And that's something that we're finding is a real challenge because it's generally a, a crisis point like now when these issues are brought to the fore, when really the preventative resilience building should be an ongoing uh, priority area for each school. But also, it's not just the school where social emotional learning happens. And the second observation is just a, a personal reflection with uh, my young nephew. Now, he's struggling at home trying to get on with work and my brother's pulling his hair out. And I've taught, told them about this as a unique teachable opportunity. I don't know about you guys, but I experience about 101 different emotions every day. And I'm normally quite stoic. I'm, I'm as steady as they come, but I'm really struggling right now. So how are these children coping? I just don't know. And BBC Bite Size and all of the homeschooling that's going on is English and it's maths. Now, this is something that is a shared experience. And I'm, I do apologize. I know someone mentioned this earlier, but talking about these experiences and it's, it's the, 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 getting into parenting territory now, but this is a new world for all of us. And I think there's a really unique opportunity for us to start raising the profile of social emotional learning because we're all going through that learning with our children as well so hopefully that's uh, just added a slightly different dimension but that john just in terms of the challenge for us it, it, well-being and resilience underpins learning in schools that's the, the the rationale that we've um focused on now and we've used over the last 15 years but it's still in that time um it hasn't really um gained any any traction since every child matters i think when there was money in schools and when the focus was there um we felt as though we were getting much more traction and interest in what we do but that has um unfortunately um made way for the academic uh, focus and narrowing of the curriculum so uh, that's that's a little bit about our work but we, we're still fighting the fight and we're hoping that um even if we're only supporting a handful of schools we're hoping that we're um, shining a light on what's possible. Yeah, yeah, many thanks, John. Many thanks, um, Matthew, then Rachel. Yeah, so John, I was just responding to the, the, the appeal for like what's worked and experiences. I, I wanted to mention roughly three things quickly. Um, one is that we, We've done some research and uh, in the last few years in, in Tanzania, which is kind of su suggested supporting um, something that Gavin was saying um, about agency. Although we've been kind of calling it confidence, it sort of comes from the fact that when you ask parents what they want their children to do in school in rural Tanzania, they say they want them to be respectful and obedient. If you ask teachers, teachers say we want our kids to be confident and curious. And actually, I think this is one of those skills that. Um, anecdotally can be um, improved pretty quickly like you you get kids to you encourage kids to participate even in you know some remote village in, in Tanzania where they've never been encouraged to speak and they and they they, they learn to speak up pretty quickly um, and strangely um, there's no evidence on it because somehow people don't even measure this they don't they measure something else like self-esteem and it isn't self-esteem I mean Self-esteem is important, I think, in the West for speaking up, but in Tanzania, it's more about just understanding your social role and when it's appropriate to speak up. Um, so we're calling it confidence, social confidence, but still trying to figure it out. But um, anyway, it's something that can be, I, I think, can be developed pretty quickly through getting kids to participate. And relatedly, I think the other area which we've had success in is just in changing classroom climate, you know, which is at, at the extreme just removing violence but just more generally creating a supportive and positive environment in classes and, and I think that um, I know that the group at NYU are doing an evidence review at the moment and they're telling me that this is the only area which has solid evidence of um, in, in lower middle income countries um, for building SCL um, working on, on classroom climate and the third thing is I, I often so one interesting observation I think about the entry point for this is that I think one way that pe people typically think about this 
is that um, how, how are we going to find time to um, get teachers to promote social emotional learning when, um, when they're so focused on, on teaching maths? But actually, in some ways, we have the opposite problem in Tanzania, is that we can't, we can't get teachers to focus on teaching maths, at least using the techniques that we're training them on, because they're so focused on, on the social um, uh, climate of the, of the classroom. So for, just for some examples, if teachers won't use different, um, teachers ask each child the same question, and, and you talk to them about why that is, and they say, we don't like to make children feel bad about things they don't know, so that they're, they're never really testing kids. And as I mentioned before, there's this thing about we don't like to break the classroom up um, because we want the sense of togetherness and fairness is at the top of, there's lots of beneficial teaching practices to Tanzanian teachers won't do because they think they're unfair. So this is just to make the point that you talk to a typical a Tanzanian teacher, and I'm sure it's the same in many countries around the world, they've already got all of these social emotional issues at the top of their mind. Um, and it's not a case of introducing a, a, some curriculum from outside that's going to teach them a whole bunch of new concepts. They're already there and, and you can, that's such a great entry point to build on what they're already themselves concerned about. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Rachel? Yeah, I, I was just going to pick up and, and really say that I think that schools have to exercise some caution in many respects. Um, I know that there's this uh, big push on developing these skills, but many schools are already doing that exceptionally well. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that's been very successful in some of the um, places where I've worked with is that, that we have a values curriculum that underpins everything and that is decided by all stakeholders. It's not done to, it's done with. Um, and that really is a driver for those behaviours for learning. Um, and that brings a sense of connectiveness and relationships and that is intrinsic to, um, you know, supporting all those behaviours that we've discussed. Um, and I think schools have these programs already. We have self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationships, decision-making programs that support our students. And, and we've, got, we've got to, you know, we've got to celebrate what we already do as well. And I think it's not about starting again, but bringing it to the forefront of everybody's minds. And the, and the best practice is those schools are already doing that. And it's just part of their ethos. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. So like, good common themes there in terms of engagement, um, in terms of both how we're engaging people and what we're engaging them in. Um, could we have Ross then, Ian? Thanks. Yeah, Rachel, just building on your point, I think this is really critical, this distinction between doing to and doing with, I think seems to be fundamental here. Um, so it's not that we have a curriculum and we are going to teach you these things, but rather we're going to invite you into conversations, I think, um, through which we can find our own uh, confidence, our own uh, inner powers and bring them to the fore, I think. And I think so my sense is that there's something about inviting uh, new, robust conversations with young people, with teachers, with school leaders, with parents, with other people in the community. And I think if we can perhaps root um, this movement in new conversations, which include sharing stories, um, sharing experiences that we've all had, um, and sharing evidence, then we might just draw people into uh, this movement. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, there's, there's sort of a whole bunch of things because everyone who speaks there's something I want to say in response. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, well, at least I'm going to try and avoid it. I want to pick out a, a, f a few po points um, and also share a story because that seems to be what people are suggesting is a good thing. I think, Ross, your, your idea of the kind of, a, well, I think other people have said this as well, the kind of global movement of existing good practice is, is spot on. But I do think that there's a challenge that there's also a kind of global movement going the other way in terms of centralised people making decisions and they tend to be ministers who tend to have considerably more clout than, than classroom practitioners. And I think we do need to do something that kind of addresses them and their concerns. And not, not so much the ministers, because I think a lot of ministers are actually 
um, quite open-minded and quite forward-thinking. It's, it's the people two or three rungs below the minister who are really worried about the security of their job and don't want to take a punt on something that might go wrong. I just wanted to pick up on some of the points, I think particularly that Matthew made about confidence and, and classroom climate. And I agree that those are both absolutely critical. And I think one of the things that, that we do at TBI, we have a program called Generation Global, and we, we do global dialogues. And, and certainly since COVID, we've been doing global dialogues about people sharing their experience of what this has been like for them. So we've done a few recently with teachers from all over the world. We work in about 30 countries and kind of having teachers sharing their experience and frustrations of trying to do their job when um, everything is kind of going, going to hell around them and, and people and trying to balance that with their family lives and having their kids at home and only having enough internet for, for one connection. Because I mean, a lot of the stuff that's come out, people have gone, hey, we'll put everything online. But a lot of other countries you don't have enough bandwidth or a lot of people only have one device and, and who gets it? Is it dad who's working from home or the three kids? Well, we know the answer to that one. Um, so we've been giving people opportunities for, for sharing their stories and increasingly as well, getting students to talk about their situations as well and the kind of challenges that they've been facing and the ways that they've been developing resilience and, and kind of inspiring one another as a result of that. So I think we're absolutely right in going down this direction of, of kind of building up a consensus. But I do think we need to balance it with that kind of something centralised, something that needs a kind of, a, you know, systems do need to change because if, if the system doesn't change, no matter all the good practice that thousands of individuals are already doing, won't, won't move the dial for all the places where it's not working or it's being, let's face it, it is being actively suppressed. A lot of teachers are not being taught how to teach. They're not getting any CPD. They're not getting any resources. There is violence in the classroom and the ministry turn a blind eye to it or condone it. Parents back that up. There are lots of places where, you know, the only educational outcomes are that matter are STEM related. And there are kind of big societal things that drive that. And it, in order to get SEL on the agenda for everyone, I think it's really important we get it on the agenda for everyone, for every child, for every teacher, for every system. So, um, I'll pass over to Gavin in just a second, who's got his hand up. But just one thing I think would be really good to pick up before we go back in about 15 minutes is just whether anyone has got any sort of practical experience of doing that with um, ministries and sort of things that have worked or may not have. Because I think with education being the political football that it is, um, and cell perhaps being less sort of um, well structured as a domain in terms of things that are easily measured and seen than maths and English. How do we actually practically move the conversation on in the way in that you're describing? And um, there may be no answers to that yet, but I think it'd be interesting to just open that up in a minute. I'll, I'll pass to Gavin first and then open it back up. <coughs> I, I, I there's so much it's such a good conversation thank you everybody i'm so pleased i'm with this group <laughs> uh, but and uh, by the way ian has won the bookshelf award for this group they uh, but the uh, just one thing it, it occurs you know there's a number of different problems so i think there, you're absolutely right rachel there is uh, fantastic work going on it's not everywhere, and we, we know that. So how, how, what, what are the tactics, if you like, or the strategies we can use to spread that out? There are problems with systems, but that's a different problem. So how do we deal with the ministers? I, I, and a lot of my experience is working with ministers. But I organise the Education World Forum each year, and that's a, an interesting experience. But um, we have around about 100 ministers coming to that, and it's trying to actually persuade them and shift their... Uh, points of view uh, and it's a different set of tactics you use in that condition uh, but there's also I, I think another one which we haven't talked about and I just wanted to get this into I, I don't know if any of you has come across James Williams and his book Stand Out of Our Light but that talks about the computers companies that uh, de derive their power and their income from gaining our attention so I they they have marketing departments and PH, people with PhDs and I mean, banks of people with PhDs who are working out the strategies to grab our attention and therefore to go down that route. I'm not anti-technology, far from it, but I think we shouldn't think of it as being one thing. We've got to be careful that we, when we make our decisions, 
and we decide how we're going to use different tools that we don't fall for that. Uh, uh, James makes his uh, uh, differentiation between uh, intention and attention. We may have good intentions. We look it up and um, I get onto Twitter to kind of do some work looking at something with good intentions and I'm very quickly distracted to, to something else uh, as a result of it. So how do you manage that kind of thing in, in, in all, all of this? So that getting business uh, and employers actually on in the same position, understanding the support of intentions, which is a support of agency, if you think, if, as, as I see it, uh, as being important. And just by the way, stand out of our light as a, a reference to Diogenes, who apparently was, uh, he, he had done Alexander the Great, a great service, good service. This is my example from my recent experience. And he, as a result of that, uh, Alexander the Great called up Diogenes, presumably by phone or Skype, uh, 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 and what he, uh, what he said was, look, you can have anything you like in the world. Diogenes' response was, stand out of my light. You're, you've given me something, you know, you've made an offer to me that's taking all my attention. <laughs> what I need is to have my attention on the things that I want to do, not on the things you want me to have. So it's it. Sorry, a broad reflection. No, super, um, super helpful, Gavin. Um, one thing that I think is super interesting here that is coming up again and again in the discussion is this whole idea of agency, right? Like, how do we change this conversation from being doing things to to doing things with? Um, I, I guess that, like, sort of my, my personal like, experience of this is I think there's lots of brilliant work that happens in this area, like the closer you get to the ground, right? Where there I think is lots of like really interesting stuff from the development of, um, like Rachel was talking about, like values-based curricula that have been developed with the key stakeholders who are actually gonna be involved in the delivery of that. I think the further you go up the chain though, the harder this seems to be, um, I kind of ironically, right? Because ultimately, um, government ministers are the people with the clout and who make the decisions. But often, just going back to what I was saying before, it quite often feels that their decisions are bound by like sort of a wider political agenda at times, and the need to be able to show like concrete, measurable progress in things. Um, I just wonder, just to sort of throw that reflection open and ask whether anyone's got any sort of thoughts um, or have experienced something similar or have tried to engage governments in a way that sort of try to overcome that issue. Um, yeah. Uh, Ross, then Aileen, then Ian. There's two very quick thoughts, one of which is, you know, there are really interesting people in government. I think it's easy to sort of imagine that every government is this dark bureaucracy that really doesn't want to change. There are great people in pretty much every government I, I've come across. And there are some standouts, you know, Joao Costa in Portugal is doing some beautiful work where his philosophy was instead of imposing more rules on schools, let's release some, let's release them. So he said, I think it's 15 hours a week or something. Every school can do what they want within 15 hours a week or something along those lines. You know, so he, he essentially gave agency to schools by stepping out of the way. So I think that's, that's worth considering. The other thing I think is worth noting is that in every government, as far as I can see, in every system, as far as I can see, which is obviously governed by a government, there are people... Uh, lots of people who are following the rules in a very strict way and feeling very constrained. And then there are some people who are interpreting the rules and finding freedom to do what they want. So again, I don't think it's as simple as to say that, you know, it's all about the rules. In many ways, I think it's about how we interpret the rules and how we help each other find our agency within the same system. Thank you. Um, Aileen, I think you had your hand up, but you've put it down again. 
that? Yeah, and sorry, because the question shifts. <laughs> That's a couple times when there was a couple things I was going to contribute, but then you shifted the question. So should I go ahead or not? No, do, do go ahead. I mean, I think the nature of this conversation is that things are going to go back and forth. Okay. A bit. So do, do okay, okay, okay. I just don't want to take it um, in a direction that you're trying to take it in another way. Um, so a couple things. One is thinking about the role of touch. In, in these contexts. We know how important touch is in human development and child development. And so we've been thinking about togetherness and what is togetherness. What about the role of touch, which already has parameters for safeguarding uh, purposes, but now for public health purposes, there will be parameters. And how, how, how do we negotiate that? How do we work with ministers and local uh, 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 educational uh, regions who would put out protocols uh, on, on touch and schools having protocols on touch. And then also the role of play. Uh, we know how important play and play-based pedagogies, which are learner-centered, are for social and emotional learning, all learning, um, whatever the social and emotional learning is for, employment, academic attainment, relationships, um, security, all, you know, the multiple levels and the role of play and play pedagogies. Um, where is the play occurring? There's some, there are different types of play. There's a, a continuum between play and play work that is play related. <laughs> and whether it's alone or whether it's adult, whether it's peer, whether it's ed edutech, which has been mentioned. So the role of play in this and how do we continue to nurture that, which then is part of the creativity and critical thinking and problem solving. Uh, and then the role of storytelling and where is social emotional learning based within schools or curriculum? Is it a standalone curriculum? Is it integrated among all the different curricular components? Is it both and? If it's across school and for all learners, all teachers, all families, all communities, all stakeholders, is it then integrated into the mathematics and science and reading and writing and literacy and is it also standalone and just a quick experience a webinar involving the head of the happiness project as well as um, stephanie jones who heads up um, at harvard education and several other people but there was a, a question asked so what is the best way to introduce scl into our schools and the person in who headed up the happiness project said well for us it's such a huge paradigm shift for our teachers that we have to begin as a standalone course and hope that we can start integrating it. And, the, and Stephanie from Harvard said, well, for us, it's such a big paradigm shift in the States that we have to integrate it into the other curricular components and hope that we can have a standalone course. So just recognizing the different cultural approaches and interpretations and understanding of this, and yet, Underneath these um, uh, examples and, and the points people have made is that it's not an SEL is not an optional add on. And it seems as if some schools are recognizing that, but perhaps not all, or how do we spread it? It's not an optional add on for some students or targeted populations, it's for everyone. And so how, how do we continue to advocate for that with ministers and build relationships, um, multi agency working relationships? Uh, that are consult consultative and collaborative. And then just a, um, and that's something that we've been working on. So we work with both departments or ministries of, of health, as well as departments and ministries of education and build bridges and collaborative um, partnerships across them. And there can be some real resistance there for various reasons, but trying to show that it's actually, um, we have some of the same goals and we can contribute and work together. And then on a, um, a grassroots level or with students, with teachers, how do we do this? And there are, uh, there are um, frameworks out there, for example, the cultural formulation interview that enables people to begin with their stories of what they've experienced or they are experiencing. How do they understand it? How are they making sense of it? And it, it's a starting place that in itself becomes the first opportunity if, if, if they haven't done this before, to have social and emotional learning, to actually put names on things, to be supported, to talk about it. And then, and then the, so, and to tell their story 
and to be able to have a, um, a framework that brings some order and some comprehension out of the chaos of what they've been experiencing, which a lot of, a lot of learners with COVID are experiencing, whether that's at home or in the school or, or otherwise, in, in the chaos in their head. So those were just a few things I wanted to bring in to um, touch on what some other people had said. Yeah, hugely, hugely helpful. Thanks, Aileen. Um, we uh, are getting a bit short on time, everyone. Could I, there's a few people I think who still want to speak. Could, could I just ask, because I think um, the, the whole point of this has been trying to capture as much of like, your kind of experience, thoughts and views as possible. Um, and I don't think we're going to have a chance to hear everyone here. Could I ask that you just type into the chat sort of your like thought reflection here as well, just so that we don't lose it when we get brought back, um, just because it'd be enormously helpful to, to have. Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe pass over to Ellie in just a minute, who's been taking notes just for any sort of final thoughts, reflections before we, before we go back. Um, but just to say a massive thank you for the richness of, of this discussion. Um, I know it sort of has gone in slightly different directions at times, um, but I think I was just very, very keen for people who are working in this space in slightly different ways to be able to sort of share their thoughts and experiences with each other um, and for us to learn from them as well. Um, there's a, lots of you I'd love to pick up this conversation with individually as well. I think from our work at STIR, um, everyone here is good something that we could learn quite a lot from um, so if you're happy for me to contact you individually um, then I, I, I will do so and I'd encourage you to of course do the same with, with each other as well because I think there's also an enormous wealth of, of thoughts here so just to say a big big thanks for the discussion um, and uh, Ellie if I hand over to you. Thanks John um, and I think Will might ask me to summarise um, to everybody following Loic summary when we go back. But I think um, it's been hugely interesting to listen to you all. So thank you so much for your contributions. I think the key themes that I've heard coming up again and again, that I'll definitely mention if we don't have too much overlap with the other group, um, will be this sort of tension between the opportunity to reset priorities and concerns about whether the decision makers in the system are going to allow that and whether there is more of a push to return to normality and to return to priorities that we've previously had that perhaps don't, in certainly not in all contexts, put SEL um, as high on the agenda as we would perhaps like to see it being. Um, and I think the fact that this, you know, this opportunity is here in the sense that it's become ever more important. We're a group of people here that think that SEL has always been very, very important, but I thought really interesting example of how it's become ever more important and um, really stood out for example the sort of need for us to be able to make and for young people to be able to make very difficult decisions as a sort of key skill um, that you know falls under the SEL umbrella that has become more important now um, and perhaps give it strengthens the argument that we need to prioritize this um, I think the who is a really important point that, um, that John made we've had a lot of conversation about which stakeholders this is about um, from talking about employers and how they're going to be involved to talking about how within schools and educational institutions it needs to be um, something that brings in everybody um, and that we need to think about, especially if we're going to talk about big changes or um, rethinking the things we do, that it's people that have to implement that. So it's staff um, that will have to do a lot of work to make sure that young people are supported and we need to make sure that we're thinking about all the players in that situation and supporting staff um, in schools and other institutions as well. Um, I think some of the key challenges we've talked about, which I don't feel like we fully unearthed, so it'd be really interesting to hear more from you guys, were around sort of decision making and whether, um, whether governments would want to do this. And I think there's been really interesting contributions about different cultures and therefore different cultural priorities. Um, sort of telling us different things about whether or not decision makers, policy makers um, would, would push this kind of change that we want to see. Um, and another point that I'll touch on is this point of agency. 
um, heard that come up again and again and it's tied into oh, 50, 59 second countdown brilliant um, and it's really tied in to both what skills we feel are important but also how the SEL that we'd like to see um, young people and children having access to is about doing something with them allowing them to bring their experience be that through storytelling play I thought Aileen made those really good points rather than something that we impose upon peoples.